Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guests, Kaz Tanahashi and Susan O'Leary, and they're here to share with us their new book, Delight in 1000 Characters, the classical manual for East Asian calligraphy. So welcome to the show, Kaz and Susan. Thank you. What a great honor it is to have both of you here. I am just over the moon excited about this. Um, Susan, why don't we, well, actually, Kaz, why don't we start with you? Like, What inspired you to write this book? Oh, this is um, kind of a book of art, language, and um, literature from ancient China. And then I'm a calligrapher with East Asian style, kind of originated from China. And uh, this is the sixth century artwork, most important and best known, and then earliest known calligraphy text, textbook from the sixth century. So uh, it's very interesting. I had written a book called Heart of the Brush, Splendor of East Asian Calligraphy. So this is also a kind of calligraphy textbook. And this, the new book is like a sister book to that. Actually, studying from the ancient masterpieces, and then we can enjoy looking at the work and understanding the meanings of each character. And uh, so sort of, uh, go from there. Is this becoming somewhat of a lost art in many ways? Because it's absolutely, it's just beautiful. Well, it, it's an ancient art. You know, the uh, ideographs were created 2,000 years ago. And then maybe classical time of Chinese calligraphy ran from the 2nd century to the t- 10th century of the common era. So it's an uh, archaic art, but it's very, very uh, popular in China, Korea, and Japan. I think, uh, the, you know, um, this writing is sort of with the brush, is no longer a kind of uh, practical use, except for some special invitations or special menus kind of personalized menu uh, or uh, store uh, signs. But calligraphy is so popular in China and in Japan never been so popular uh, than ever. So there are a lot of uh, exhibitions, competitions, kind of uh, local school or group shows and then uh, local uh, national shows, and uh, also solo exhibitions all over all the time. It sounds like just a beautiful way of presenting and and really keeping that culture going forward. And so, Susan, with you, what interested you in becoming part of this? Uh, Well, Kaz and I have been friends. I was thinking back, it's going on 20 years now. And that started because I started studying calligraphy with him. Um, And just adding on to what Kaz was saying, um, I'm certainly not a great calligrapher. uh, But in the study of calligraphy, first off, it's a very centering process, and it it really can help you um, just be more in the present. Uh, But also, as you study it, your eye becomes clearer, and you see things in more detail, you see beauty in more detail. So you don't have to necessarily achieve a uh, a profound level of expertise in calligraphy to learn more about what the beauty is in it. Um, So that's what I've enjoyed. And Kaz has been coming. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Kaz has been coming to teach here. Gee, well, it's like 18 years, I guess now. And we decided to do an advanced class on um, on different calligraphers. And so this one year we were studying Zhi Yong and we were in my kitchen. I was I was at the the stove cooking, and Kaz was sitting behind me, and he uh, he said very slowly, "Earth is not yellow; it's ochre." 
because the the beginning of the essay uh, refers to the skies and the heavens and the color of the of the earth. And the translation we were working from called Earth Yellow, because in Taoist imagery, the color for earth is yellow. However, in this part of China, where where it was written, the earth would have like a yellowish, orangish color, um, just like in Georgia, it'd be kind of a reddish color. Um, and so he was just really reflecting on those um, those elements of how you would say that one word that rep- represents two things in Chinese. And I just knew he was uh, that a new book was brewing uh, behind my back while I was cooking. Um, and so Kaz, a few months later, invited me into uh, writing it together. Well, I'm so delighted that the both of you did this. It is, I felt, just an amazing book. And Kaz, how long have you been studying calligraphy? Uh, I would say maybe 1,700 years. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when I talk about you, (laughs) maybe many of us, (laughs) in a way. But um, since I was 23 or so, I was uh, very serious. Of course, I studied that in primary school in Japan, um, but um, 23 years old, and now I'm 89 years old, so for some time. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have guessed that, you know, my goodness. Mm-hmm. And, but the level of expertise that must be taken into really understanding what each of the words are saying, because there are multiple meanings, right? Yes. Uh, so the kind of uh, uniqueness of our book is we have this uh, great kind of original piece by Ji Yong, 6th century, and uh, he uh, he did sort of, he made a calligraphy textbook, but he was kind of living in the temple, and then he made 800 copies. He wrote it in a vertical way, and then uh, wrote it in a very long horizontal paper, and folded it, and then give away. Uh, each each one of piece. So out of 800, one copy has survived for 1,400 years in Japan. And it is a national treasure of Japan. It's called the Ogawa Manuscript. So I talked to Mr. Ogawa, the current owner, and then asked for permission to use the photographs. So we have the actual kind of photographic reproduction of the original piece. And then we numbered uh, the characters, 1,000 characters. And then, so we have four columns in on the right-hand side page. And then we have explanations of the pronunciations and then meanings, perhaps sometimes multiple meanings of each character, and then notes, and then translation. Uh, So you can see that uh, even without knowledge of Chinese, uh, anyone can sort of figure out uh, what it means and what it means altogether. Well, what a gift to have that in the book. I mean, that's that is such a treasure, and to be able to share that with the world, my goodness, thank you. Yeah, it's so. Uh, in a way, it's quite miraculous, you know. Like <laughs> just one copy survived. I mean, it used to be the in the imperial treasure house in Nara, uh, built in the sixth century. So they had this maybe climate kind of moisture control. So when it is kind of the the air is moist, it's made of wood. So it cracks open, the the joints of the walls uh, uh, crack open. And actually when it is moist, it's closed. And then when it is dry, it opens and then gets the dry air. So that way, uh, they have kind of kept so many treasures from 
Central Asia, from India and China, and then still we have them. So that's how it started. And then it now it became the ownership of um, the private person. But anyway, so uh, if we think about this treasure kind of in front of us, the photographs, it's quite awesome, I think. I think awesome is a really good word to use for that. (laughs) 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 Because that is, it is miraculous and awesome that yeah, it survived and that we actually get to see it courtesy mm-hmm. of both of you. So uh, my my hat is definitely off to both of you for, for making that happen. And Susan, I know you talk about just, you know, how two characters can tell a whole story. Can you kind of elaborate on that for us? Yeah, that was one of my favorite. There were a couple of favorite parts for me um, in the essay. And the two, they're actually character 915 and 916 are Liao and Ball. And one of the things for me in not having a familiarity with ancient Chinese culture and was coming to realize more and more, understanding it more. And so in just those two characters, a contemporary reader um, would have known that it referred to Shang Yi Liao who was a um, a juggler in the spring and autumn period of China. And there was a battle between the Chu and Song armies. And he stepped between the two armies and started juggling nine balls. And his skill was so inspiring of fear that the 500 Song troops just retreated. And their fear came from the power in what his juggling represented. It was the number nine with the nine balls, and that was the symbol of the emperor and of the infinite. Um, And his ability to work with the Tao in constantly moving the balls what represented the transformation of yin and yang. Uh, And his stance at the center of this battle as the center of energy flowing between heaven and earth was part of why he had such power. So that really struck me, just that people reading this 1400 years ago would have known that they that that meaning of the text would have just come in right for them um and it's because of cause and causes uh notes in the book that we could come to understand that there was there was an epic story just in two characters and i loved that about it that's just fascinating and it's interesting i've often heard that when people study a new language it opens a different part of your brain in many ways and i can see how Um, learning how to do this type of uh, calligraphy, how that would really open up a person to new possibilities. So you're talking about presence earlier. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I I know um, the listeners can't see the book, but in our presentation in the book, when Ji Young um, calligraphed it, he would do formal script for 10 characters and then cursive script of the same two characters or the, the same 10 characters. And so you can look even not reading it, just aesthetically, you can look at one representation of meaning and right next to it, another representation in a very different style, and then just go right over to the facing page and see what that character means. So it's it's a, a really beautiful way of entering into um, the beauty of calligraphy. Now, Susan, was it difficult to structure this book? Because it's very thorough. It's, I've like, I've told friends, it's, um, it's like a 19th century book. It's so thorough. Um, I'm sure that's not a great marketing strategy. Uh, But actually, our conversations um, really helped to structure the book. Um, And so we, we have a really beautiful map of ancient China at the beginning, which um, has all the geographic references in the essay represented in the map. And then um, there, we have two chronologies of ancient China. Um, and this is where I was thinking about this this morning. If we had both been experts in this, it would have been a very different book. But because I was coming new to all of this, I could kind of represent the reader in a way and um, ask the questions that someone with my level of understanding would have. And so we were able to address that more, I think, with the book. So one of the things for me was um, 
there are many references to um, different dynasties um, in in ancient Chinese history, and I was not familiar with it, and I just had to create a graph for myself to um, to represent that. Uh, and so we ended up really refining those um, the graphs. And there's um, a really beautiful bar graph of the duration of dynasties in ancient China, but then also another graph with the periods, dynasties, and states because. Um, the states of this one period of ancient China are, are repeatedly represented. And so that wouldn't go into the, the first bar graph, but it, it helped to understand it in that way. So just at the begin, the front matter, we had had those for the reader to reference. And then I wrote a preface, Kaz wrote an introduction. We have the translation of the entire um, thousand character essay by itself. And then um, with Ji Young's representations of uh, with you know with his cal- calligraphy of the um of the text, the facing pages have the detail that just got revealed about what we needed in it um as we work together with the typographic representation in modern calligraphy or modern Chinese characters, um, followed by the meanings, the translation in China, the pronunciation in Chinese of each of the characters footnotes on meaning and then the four the 20 characters what part of the essay those are um are at the bottom of the page so it's there's just a richness for the reader to to see there and then beyond that uh Kaz thought it would be important because this was a calligraphy manual in not only China but Korea Vietnam and Japan and so the pronunciations in all those languages come at the end we put in an index of names so people could um, could find those references and then an index of terms so that um, it could be used as a calligraphy manual and people could look in the back to look for characters that they in particular wanted to study and brush uh, and find them there. So yeah, it, it just kept getting revealed about, oh, we could do this. And in part, it was because we, um, we were working on it during the pandemic and um, especially that first summer of the pandemic, when you couldn't get a reference book, you couldn't go to a library for reference books, you couldn't get them in the mail. It just slowed our process down. Uh, and I think that in a way helped us too. So Susan, would you like to read the first part of the translation? The text is so interesting. And uh, this text became so important in China. So uh, people would sing sing it as a lullaby, uh, also uh, using it for teaching languages and calligraphy. And also um, it became a library index code. So all books in the libraries are uh, not kind of uh, classified by numbers, but by these characters of 1,000 uh, character essays. So, People have to memorize where uh, where is a character to find a book, and also it became like a, a, a dedicating kind of like a seat for the uh, examination for becoming uh, becoming an official government officials. So you can see that uh, it's been. Uh, learned by many, many people, actually most kind of literate people, they have to learn this character. So yeah, Susan, please read the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I wrote just a paragraph about it afterwards too. So I'll I'll continue into that. But but what Kaz said there, it's like, just imagine what a profound part of culture this essay was for hundreds of years. And in it, he he doesn't explicitly say, but he he's saying this is who we are, and this is what we believe. So it begins: the heavens are black, earth is ochre, space is vast, time limitless. Sun and moon travel in their cycles, while constellations hold array. Cold and heat come and go. Autumn harvests. Winter stores. An intercalary month completes a year. 
high and low pitches, harmonize yin and yang. Clouds ascend to turn to rain. Dewdrops congeal to form frost. Gold comes forth from the Lee River. Jade is found in Kungang Valley. There is a sword called Great Eliminator, a jewel called Night Glow. Favored fruits are plum and crabapple. Esteemed vegetables are mustard and ginger. And so I wrote after that, we live in accord with nature and that is the ground of our perception. Ours is a culture sustained by harvest and store. Science matters and has created our calendar, our sense of meteorology. We know where treasured minerals and stones are found. Our stories include the five swords of the ruler of Zhao state and the legendary Yi Yang pearl that was once the eye of a whale. Our favorite fruits are plum and crab apple. Our esteemed vegetables, mustard and ginger. This is who we are. Well, that is just beautiful. And, and you know, it's interesting once someone's diving into this book, there's so much richness to it. You know, it's not just calligraphy, like as you know, people may think, or just history. There's a richness to it that brings it all to life. Yeah, thank you. So you can see it's quite foreign and quite archaic and uh, fascinating, isn't it? So the text was written by uh, Joe Shinshi of the 6th century uh, in the uh, kingdom of um, Southern Kingdom of Lao. Yeah. So um, he wrote it in the verses. So it's called the essay, but it's actually uh, has a poetic form. All characters creates one verse. So we have 250 verses. And then every other verse at the end, the last kind of characters kind of rhyme. So rhyming uh, means that maybe it can have the first part consonant can be different, but the, uh, the ending part vowels kind of match uh, sound and tone in Chinese. So you can see that there is a kind of constant rhyming patterns, and then it changes. So if we study the rhyming patterns, we can divide the text into nine parts. So, uh, and the nine parts represent different uh, <clears throat> Topics. So I'd like to just just show you what kind of topics. The first one, as you can see, nature and mythological history. Second part, self -dis discipline. Third, conforming to the hierarchical society. The fourth, two capital cities, east and west, and then imperial court. The fifth part, official life. The sixth, a solitary life in nature. Seventh part, daily personal affairs. Eighth part, notable po people in history. And then the last part, grammar. So you can see these are the main topics. Those are just phenomenal. I just love how that all comes together. And thank you for going over that. Is is Can you share the story of the Orchard Pavilion with us? Yes. So um, this um, calligraphy is based on the style of one Shiji, the fourth century calligrapher regarded as the sage of calligraphy, very kind of uh, very beautiful, but also very gentle style so that maybe most people feel kind of, we should study one city. And then um, uh, it was later written by his descendant. But um, so one city uh, kind of worked for the 
Eastern Jing dynasty in the court, but he really liked to be in the countryside and then uh, to kind of do some more cult cultural activities, you know, music and poetry and in calligraphy. So he became a governor of one province, um, Shanyin, a little bit south of present-day Shanghai. Um, and then one time he had a rite for Taoist kind of rituals. And then he invited uh, over 30 poets. And then uh, they had this, they lined up on the book and then they uh, floated cup with uh, wine. And then when the cup stops in front of somebody, the person has to drink the, the wine or write a poem. So that was a gathering. And then when Shiji wrote, he was a kind of a, maybe uh, the host, but he was kind of uh, describing the event. So uh, it's called the preface for the Orchid Pavilion, um, poetic gatherings. Anyway, so Susan and I also earlier uh, translated uh, this uh, preface. So Susan, would you like to read it or talk about it? Sure. Um, but it just it's like to give a sense of it, it was it was in the spring and it was a purification rite that they had all taken taken part in in nature. And then they went to this um to this river that or like this what, what would you call it, Kaz? Well it's it's smaller than a river for sure. It's a brook. A, brook. A brook. Yeah. Yeah, a brook. Um, yeah. stream. Stream. It, it was very zigzaggy, so that it was easy for a cup of wine to uh, stop in front of you. Um, so this is his preface after the, he had been with his friends up for this Taoist purification rite, and now they'd all come together to celebrate literature. And he wrote, in the ninth year of the era of eternal peace, year of the younger water ox, at the beginning of late spring, we gather at the Orchid Pavilion, Shanyin Prefecture, Huiji region, to conduct a rite of purification. A group of wise ones has assembled, young and old, all are here. This land has lofty mountains, their jagged peaks rising above dense forests over groves of tall bamboo. Near us is a pure stream with roaring rapids, its waters reflecting both sides of its shores. We channeled its flow, created a small meandering brook to float wine cups. The guests have gathered at both sides of its banks, seated in rows. Although there is no extravagance of music with lute or flute, one poet after another composing and reciting a poem when a wine cup stops in front of one is enough for us to share our deepest feelings. Today, the sky is clear and the air feels pure. A blessing breeze gently blows. Looking up, we see the vastness of the universe. Looking down, we know the flourishing of all things. Thus, we gaze outward, letting the mind float. We are filled with the complete joy of seeing and hearing. This is a day to truly enjoy. For indeed, in reflecting on life, people may embrace a multitude of ways, some speaking intimately with friends in closed rooms, others following their thoughts, wandering freely outside the body. However different their ways may be, some still, others active, they find joy in life's encounter, momentarily achieving the illusory contentment of self, forgetting old age's certain arrival. When we weary of our accomplishments or our emotions are caught by transient matters, our feelings also change. What pleasure we once rejoiced in quickly becomes memory. Even so, we cannot help but be drawn back to being, fully aware that our short lives are fleeting, and in the, the end, there is only death. So it does get a little perkier after that, but I just think it's such a beautiful piece. 
That is a beautiful piece. And you could see the just the poetic features of it as it flows through. I, I think most of us can listen to that all day. So well, this calligraphy, um, he wrote it. And then, of course, he did some corrections and he added some characters. And this was a draft. And then next day, he wanted to kind of write a clean uh, piece. But he could not uh, do anything better. So uh, he kept it as it is. So it was usually, it's rather very unusual kind of uh, masterpiece in Chinese calligraphy. This was all uh, corrections and then uh, crossing away. And so it be, it was known as kind of maybe one of the foremost calligraphy in the history of Chinese calligraphy. And then later in the 7th century, Emperor Tai, the second emperor of uh, Tang Dynasty, uh, wanted to have it. So he sent somebody kind of... Uh, to kind of study with one CG and then this person kind of stole the piece and then brought it to the emperor. Of course, that time uh, one CG was no longer alive, but some one of his descendants kind of was keeping it. So you can see that, uh, and then emperor loved it so much. So he willed that this will be buried with him. So we lost the original piece. But before that, a number of people, calligraphers, made kind of a very faithful copy of it. And then many uh, stone carvings were made so that we can sort of, calligraphers nowadays study the stone rubbings of the piece. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. <laughs> and that's it's great to understand that that's just so ingrained in the history like that. When you were able to get a copy of you know the the essays, did it take a long time to go through and and read it? You you've been doing this for a while, is it just like, oh, this is what it says? Did you take a lot of time to just be thoughtful and go through it? Um well, the uh Susan and I went to this orchid pavilion, so, the, so there's a museum, and then so that we can buy uh, stone rubbings very easily. So we have that. And also this being printed, you know, like a calligraphy textbook. So uh, many serious calligraphers actually, you know, in whether it's the calligrapher is in Taiwan or Korea or Japan or China. They study the uh, reproduct, reproducted, printed copy of the stone rubbings. So it's white characters on, on black background, right? And then uh, this been all kind of uh, put into ideograph uh, types, so it's easily to understand. And um, so the, I'm trying to read uh, ancient Chinese characters. So I could, I had a great pleasure of working with Susan and then translating it into uh, English. Another interesting part of Wang Shiji's story is that uh, his teacher was a woman which was absolutely unheard of in the time. And she was not allowed to study calligraphy. Uh, her brothers and cousins could, but she couldn't. Um, but she watched, you know, she probably brought tea to them or got materials for them. And she just watched the whole process and then would study by herself in her room. And her uncle finally saw it and allowed her to, um, to study that too. And she, um, as an adult, she wrote a, an essay called On Handwriting, where she uh, really described the power of what a calligrapher does and, and how strokes are made. Uh, now, when um, strokes are broken down, 
for people to study. It's uh, the eight, eight characters, but she was, or the eight strokes of um, a character, but she was the first one who broke it down into, into seven strokes. And she wanted, she, she studied movement in nature, just like Wang Shiji did. And she wanted her dot stroke to have the force of a stone falling against a tree. Um, and she also looked at for, for a curved, um, one of the curved strokes, she looked at how Rattan leaned against a tree and learned the curve from there. And she wrote that a calligrapher's brushing should be more bone than flesh. And that just, that just to me really sums up what you see in um, the stroke of, uh, of Wang Shiji and, and other, um, other calligraphers. So he also loved her dearly. Uh, and after she died, he wrote a letter to a friend about her. And, and it just it just showed how much she had meant to him. So it's you don't run across that many uh, women calligraphers in ancient China. And she was tremendously important in the era. Has her work survived as well? Yes, yes. Some, yes. Uh, you know, uh, actually, no actual pieces of Wang Shiji have survived. You know, the paper, so uh, it decays. Um, but often uh, important pieces of hers and then his were carved into stones. Or made copies, and then cop so other people made copies of copies. So in a way, that way, uh, we have access to these ancient calligraphers' work. So how was it that you were able to do the translation? Friends have asked me how I could translate the the essay since I don't speak or read Chinese, and actually. You don't need one of the people to um, speak or read the language that's being translated. What often, a way people often work on translation is you will have one native speaker. So like that's me of English and the, the language being translated into, and then one native speaker of the language that's being translated. We obviously don't have any native speakers of classical Chinese now, but Kaz has a scholar's depth and awareness of it. And so that's how the two of us translated. Uh, the etymology of translation is really beautiful. It's to carry across, translatere. So when you're translating, you are carrying meaning across from one culture to another. And I really grounded what I did in that sense of how do we carry meaning from this culture to our culture? And because I don't speak or read Ch Chinese, especially classical Chinese, I looked at some former translators, not to like copy what they were doing, but to see what the style and tone was of their translation to help clarify for me what I wanted to bring to our style and tone and translation. Yeah, but Susan, uh, Susan likes to maybe check with earlier translations, but I never read other people's translation. I only <laughs> kind of look at the original text. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So Nathan Sturman uh, was a, a really amazing person. He had no uh, academic affiliation, but he loved this essay. And so he, on his own, translated the essay rhyming um, to like, like be more like the classical version of it um, and posted it online. And while we were working on it, um, I came across that and read it and loved what he had done uh, and realized he had died maybe five or 10 years before we, um, we did our work. And I was really sad about that because I felt so strongly his presence in loving this essay and imagine the attention he had to bring to his translation to continually have rhyming, um, a rhyming structure through it. But that didn't seem to me what I wanted to do with our carrying it across into our culture was to have such a, a traditional form. Um, Hung Zhang is a, a Chinese calligrapher who lives in the Twin Cities, and he also loves the essay and published a beautiful book in clerical script, which is a an earlier script than the ones that Ji Young used. Um, and his is a very kind of ceremonial translation. It um, 
it's exact and it's formal. And our translation is exact, but I didn't want that formal aspect of, of it in to the extent he had it in carrying it across to our culture. In the 20th century, rhythm has come to matter much more than rhyme in in most poetry or in a lot of poetry anyway. And it's that sense of what is the rhythm of language? And that seemed to me to be the best way for a modern translation to transfer the way that Zhu Xingyi used language in classical Chinese to, to carry that rhyming across into instead rhythm in what uh, what we did in our translation. And so uh, Ezra Pound was someone who really, really helped to bring this sense of, of rhyme to language. And I, I really tried to just listen to what is the sound and rhythm of what we're bringing to our work. And so Haas and I would work a couple hours a day on um, the translation. And that's one of the things I learned from Kaz in this. I mean, Kaz has written over 40 books and he just, he calls himself lazy, which um, is a koan in itself. Uh, but he just, he goes, he measures himself. He doesn't do more than what a series of days will allow. So we would start it in the morning and uh, work a couple hours a day. And then the next day, we so we would create a rough translation, kind of a literal rough translation of what we had read, or you know, of of how Kaz translated each of the the ideographs into English, and and put that together. And then the next day, and this was really my favorite part of the process, I would read out loud what we had worked on the day before, and Kaz would sit sometimes with his eyes closed, sometimes with his eyes open. And simply take in what the where we were in the work. And I would, in the process of speaking it out loud, do the same. And then after that, we would go back line by line and have a conversation about the meaning of words and about how we wanted to translate that. And then after the meaning, we would go to the level of the rhyme of a phrase and try to find exactly what we wanted in saying it. We would revise and rework and we would revise many times in doing so. So I just wanted to read the, the first two lines of the um, our translation. And it starts out, the heavens are black, earth is ochre. Space is vast, time limitless. Sun and moon travel in their cycles while constellations hold a ray. So I think you can hear how there's rhythm in there with that translation. The other part I wanted to just give an example of at the word level, uh, because a translator in carrying across often has to make a choice of one meaning or another in, in, in choosing words. And a, an example of this is before we started the book, Kaz was here in Madison teaching teaching a, his first calligraphy class on Ji Young. And we, um, we were in my kitchen, and I was making dinner after one of the days of the course. And he, he was just sitting there. He was behind my back. It's one of those moments in time you simply remember. And he said, earth is not yellow, it's ochre. And I had this sense then, okay, here's Kaz's next book, just from the way he said it. And in Chinese, the ideograph that we translated as ochre can mean either yellow or ochre. And the yellow part of it is the Taoist five elements. Yellow is the color associated with soil. The ochre part is that in this region of China, the earth is actually a, an orangish yellow, just like um, in Georgia. It's kind of a redder, redder soil than up here in the north where it's, it's very black. And so a Chinese person reading it would understand the dual meaning of the ideograph, and that it meant both a Taoist significance and both the color of the soil. But we had to choose, are we going to give a sense of the color of the soil or give a sense of its Taoist meaning? And Hang Zhe had gone with heaven is dark and the earth is yellow. That's a, a translation that uh, one of the students had brought to our class that day. Uh, and we thought it was more important to give a the Taoist sense by the uh, the natural world, 
And um, then actually we put a footnote in um, in the book too, explaining the dual meaning. But that's just an example of the types of things you have to think about when you're translating. And we went with rhythm as a way of a modern representation of rhyme. And then also those careful conversations helped us to figure out what were we going to prioritize when we couldn't give two meanings? How were we going to give one? How can people today use this book? I mean, it's got so much great information. I was just so just, I was just, the book's amazing. I just love it. How can we use this today? So Susan worked very hard to make a, um, an index of uh, names, names of people and places, but also, and also books, but also an uh, index of terms. So if you look at any um, word in English, if you like to um, find a, maybe a word like snow, well, how does it look? in formal script or cursive script, and then you can uh, see it in there. So from English, so in a way, it's kind of easy way to find Chinese characters from English from through index. So that way you can sort of enjoy looking at the Chinese character brushed kind of uh, in two ways, and then see how it sort of changes. So that's kind of taking a look at that is one thing. And then of course, taking a brush and then try that is another way. Nowadays we have uh, all kinds of good uh, online dictionaries, so uh, it's easy without knowledge of any kind of Chinese language or calligraphy. Uh, you can go to an online dictionary, um, calligraphy dictionary, and then uh, um, paste the character or the digitalized character, and then you can find uh, ancient samples anyway. So uh, that way uh, you can use this book and then, oh, the reason I'm saying is that stroke order is important because often there are uh, similar characters but written in different strokes. So different, maybe similar shape but different stroke order, maybe different characters. So you could kind of find the stroke order in the formal script, and then cursive script will be kind of following. Uh, and then do the kind of study by yourself. You can do uh, studies. Of course, it's nice to have a local master around, and I'm sure you can find some masters, if you are living in large cities. Um, so you could uh, do the brushwork too. Another way that I, I feel like the book is a rare invitation to think about culture. Uh, I That's what I came back to over and over as we were working on it. And um there are, there are oblique references to Chinese uh, writers in, in the book. And so I went and I, and I read those and I had read Lao Tzu and some, um, some Confucius, but I was unaware of Shuang Tzu and reading his work. He's, he's an astounding writer. And Thomas Merton in translating him said that it, he, this was the book he most enjoyed working on. Um, so I came to know, I came to know his writing, but also when I put the index together, I put it together in a spreadsheet um, so I could just like go through and, you know, every, every definition in a spreadsheet, and then I could go back and easily alphabetize it. But I also realized I could, um, just kind of sort by, by number and how many times something was referred to. 
So there are five different categories of jade in the essay. I'm saying this in terms of what would we highlight in our care, in our culture? If we were going to describe our culture, what 10 words would we use, say, or what that would be, okay, that would be like the back of an envelope thinking. A hundred words, you would need to start thinking about category. Um, and a thousand, you would absolutely have to organize by category, which cause demonstrated by reading off the uh, the elements of, of the essay. But going back then to, okay, five category categories of different kinds of jade, six, six categories that can mean assist, and six, two, for beautiful and government, seven, for understand and look. Good has eight characters, while receive and respect are represented in nine different ways. In this essay, there are separate signs for the second and third stars of the constellation um, known in Asia as the Northern Dipper. So how would we choose a thousand words to demonstrate what our culture is? Uh, and that, in a way, it's an invitation to like pull out the back of an envelope and come up with 10, you know, but I, I learned so much about how we exist in culture and how it defines who we are by working on this book. I can easily see that there's just so much beauty in this in regards to the the poetry, the phrases that it, that it brings, the story it tells, and the calligraphy itself is very stunning. When people are picking up this book to use it for calligraphy, is there something that they should keep in mind as they're going forward? Oh, yes. Um, as I suggested, uh, stroke order is sort of, um, it, it's sometimes obvious, but uh, um, often sort of, you have to learn each character. Each character is different, sort of. Each character has its own personality in a way. So stroke order is important. Otherwise, uh, you know, this formal script is has kind of uh, vertical line and horizontal lines. Most of them are straight and some are a little bit curved. And then these strokes are independently written. So if you uh, write it in a wrong stroke order, people may not notice. But when uh, it is in a cursive script, people can notice it. So that that is most important in a way, I think. But most importantly, kind of drawing a line is such a joy, really. And uh, each line has three points at the beginning, usually just straight pointed entering. I called it a dewdrop shape, like a triangle shape. And then uh, moving to another direction and then ending. So there are three, um, anyway, so three um, points. So we can you can smile at each point, three okay. smiles in one stroke. Just enjoy, relax. Well, Susan and Kaz, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, we enjoyed it, Marianne. Thank oh, you for asking us. Uh, to uh, oh, thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much, Marianne. Well, thank you, Kaz and Susan. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Delight in 1000 Characters, the classic manual of East Asian calligraphy. Delight in 1000 Characters is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and every place books are sold, and of course, all of our indie retailers. You can also purchase this book at the publisher, Shambhala.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. 
His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.